<coughs> Excuse me. Peace and long life. I was watching a video on here about PEX pipe because I've started working with it and our plumber was putting some PEX in the basement. <coughs> Excuse me. And last time I played with PEX, I gave up on the, the PEX rings and started using shark bites. That was miserable. I just looked at that and said, thought to myself, you crush it down on plastic and the fittings that were available were plastic. See, a plastic pipe with a plastic fitting and a steel ring. The steel ring is going to take a set. The plastic isn't. So if there's no resiliency there, I thought, mm, this isn't good. I think I gave it to my brother because he was all excited. Say, that's the only way to go is a steel ring to really get a grip. No, thanks. I've had shark bites, including plastic. For 15 plus years here. I'm still waiting for them to leak. Okay. Possibility? Not likely. In fact, down below I have shark bite on copper on the PEX pipe with a round coming up through the floor. And then I found out later on that PEX doesn't like rounds. Especially I didn't know there was a type A and a type B. I'm guessing what I worked with was prior to the new types of PEX that are all the same and don't work together at all. Shark bite anyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brass only. And I've heard a lot of trouble with plastic. However, I say that on the tub faucet has been a shark bite plastic for the last 15 plus years. 15 years, I would say. I don't know. However, what I want to get to is the point of this is PEX and it goes over to here, over to here, and you don't put A with B and B with A and A with B, and then there's pro PEX and then there's pre PEX, and then there's pre PEX PEX, and then you don't have to come, and you don't put and you do do and get it, get it, get it, get it, oh, 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 stick them with it, and you don't put it, and they don't not do it, whatever, you want it, and you put the PEX in the in the and you heat it with it, get kinked in it, back to the one, yeah, get it here, the PEX, oh, unbelievable stuff, it's going all through the hot and running while I got four. 40%. By the way, don't mix up the two packs. Dude was on speed. He blew through it. <coughs> Didn't quite get monotone, but darn close because he was going too fast. It was fortunately for me, I think I had at least two 10 ounce cups of coffee. Might have been three. And the 20 ounces of water, because if I don't drink the water, I will have severe internal trouble <laughs> the next day. Get my drift, you old guys? TMI! Yeah, but it's fun. You gotta live it. Doesn't mean you have to love it. But the guy went like a rocket through the thing. It's fortunate that I had seen some of the stuff. If you're going through it as a first-time homeowner... Run it through two or three times. The guy has great information. I'm not going to tell you which it is. It'll, all his title says is something like, is Pex bad or good? Well, he's telling you it's all good. Don't mix it. In fact, Pex A and Pex B are identical sizes. The problem comes is how they're installed. And you can't put the metal you're not supposed to put the metal band on the apex apex gets the plastic stretchy collar yeah a separate collar that's gonna work out good but he claims it does and there's a huge flow difference with pex a why because you're putting it into a larger fitting that slips into the pex pipe why because you have to stretch the pex pipe to get the fitting in so the hole in the pipe and the fitting are identical and the other one, you don't stretch the pipe. Pex B, you push it together and then put a collar on it, meaning that the barb fitting that's going in there is smaller so it can get in there. You still have to give it a little shove, but it's smaller. It's like putting a barb fitting in a rubber hose. You still have to put a hose clamp on it, but you get my drift? Sure, it expands it a little, but you got to push it in there. It's not a fight. Well, unless you're putting the wrong sizes together. But anyway... As far as presentation, if you're doing YouTube presentations, I talk too fast for many people. I'm sure of that. But at the same time, if you have the information, present it not in monotone and not in high speed. Dude needed to kick it out of overdrive. 
If you just put it in drive and talked a little fast, that's one thing. Now, Powell Machine, <laughs> that guy has fantastic information, and you can learn a lot listening to him. Slow your dang Yankee ears down and listen to the Southern drawl all the way through, okay? Because to you and I, the number is 12. To him, it's 12. Get my drift? But it's all there, and the information is succinct and direct. If you slow your Yankee ears down, you learn a lot from the guy. And I mean a lot. Oh, how do you know you're not an expert in it? No, I'm not. But I did have, what, six, seven years of engine rebuilding with minor tools and a minor engine machine shop of sorts. Rough and crude, but I was able to do most of the work that the locals needed. Valves, valve guides, valve seat, cold casting repairs. Okay, and I could go through and resurface. I couldn't cut, but I could resurface most, not all, but most heads. I needed my platen sander to be this much longer. That's all. Two and a half to three inches longer, and I could have done almost any diesel head that I wanted. Why? Because diesel heads should never be cut. You say, that's crazy. True. A deftly handled platen sander is going to do a better job for a diesel head than you're cutting on your fancy machines. But if you handle it wrong, the, the machinist will tell you that's nuts. And listen to me carefully, they are correct. What do you mean? What I have seen of platen sanding that they have shown has been horrible. A properly handled platen sander is going to be a better surface for diesel than any machine work. Period. But you are talking probably only a quarter of the people that know how to handle a platen sander at best to make it happen. Why? Diesel heads should never be cut unless absolutely necessary. Ever. If the specification is zero, degree, is zero to seven thousandths warp and zero to four thousandths twist and you're at seven and at four, don't cut it. Why? That's crazy, is it? Listen to me carefully. <coughs> An idiot taught me originally that you do your valve job, you put it together, you check your valve depth, and if they're too deep, machine the head. I was told that by two or three different experienced machinists. Your valve depth, your valves, and your compression, and your gasket hold are going to be good. You see, then what's the... The problem is the injector. When you open up your Cummins kits from the past, the B-Series and such, listen to me carefully, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you'd pull it out, and you would see all these little copper washers, three different sizes. Why? Because after the head was machined, you know what happened? Here's your seat for your injector. Here's your head deck. You machined it. You machined it. And now the injector tip is further in that bowl of that piston and it will never burn clean again ever it can't because in that bowl the deeper the injector gets it gets closer to the wall of the bowl which means the flame that's beginning hits something cold before it ever gets a chance to develop and you lose your swirl your combustion swirl is up here where it hits in the chamber where it's curled slightly and that's where your swirl begins whichever direction it wants to swirl, but usually. And without it, you get droplets, and you get blue smoking when they're idling. Don't tell me, fix the injectors. I have put new ones in there and watched this happen. And the guys with the international tractors in particular, one came to me specifically to have the valve work done. Because he made requests, and I followed his requests, what he wanted. He made measurements, he would check it, and then he'd have me double-check it. We checked for valve protrusion, but even beforehand, we checked for cracks and warp. And if it was within specifications, I couldn't cut it. And he was happy for that. He says, I'm tired of people machining things just because they have to have a machine. Can you do that? That's why I can't even fit it on my platen sander. There was one head on one international engine that I could put on there that was a diesel 
that would fit. And I can't remember which one it was. 756 or 856. It seemed like one of those or 806. One of them would just, just fit the plat. In fact, it was so close, I had to measure the end of the platen. And there was a Teflon or nylon band on the end. And when I took the nylon band on off, the entire head fit perfectly on there. But you sand carefully, stop, lift it up, turn it, end for end. Sand carefully again, pick it up, turn it, end for end. And we're talking just a few seconds. Continue to rotate it. Why? Because if you do the rotation method often enough, fast enough, soon enough, even if your head hangs off, you can turn it and make it work, but you have to check it. It's all insane what I just said. Never have anything hanging off a platen sander unless you're desperate. And that's the only way you can do it is three to five seconds, whoosh, turn, three to five seconds, turn. You have to have it hanging on a spring so you can pick it up, turn it, and put it back down. Hear, my, hear me? Don't do it unless you're experienced at it and are requested. It's insane. Well, you might as well just take a sander and run over top of the daggum thing. That's stupid. But it works. You can get a proper RA with your proper and a DA sander if needed. What do you mean? That's crazy. No, it's not. It's out there in Looney Land almost, but it's not crazy. Why? I had that specifically requested. Check the RA. He took a look at it and approved it from the international, a guy that went to international school, a Northeast expert. Yeah. Warp and twist were within four thousandths. Beautiful. Sander clean. And recheck it for me. You're correct. If you do not try to remove the highs. Do not. If it's warped and twisted and you're over there sanding on each of the corners, you will fail. You're just trying to get a surface finish for the gasket to hold. And on cast iron to cast iron, that's nice to have a little bit of a rough spot when you have a one-piece head and a one-piece block. If you're talking some others, uh, K19 Cummins, the Komatsus and such, glass. They want glass. Why? Because the individual heads walk and they can't stop it. They're easy to service, but they're not necessarily the best way to handle it. They do it because of easy servicing. Somebody can crawl into a machine and service the top end of the machine and the bottom end without ever tearing everything out. One head at a time, one man can go in, pick it up, and do it. That's what they're designed for. And cheaper service. One cylinder goes bad, replace one cylinder, put her back together, and just keep going one at a time. They've I've heard it and seen it done out in the field many times. It's insane. Pull the engine out and overhaul it. Yeah, I know. Seventy, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars. That's why they do it one at a time. The engine blows up eventually, but that's a choice they make. I've even heard of engines surviving with K-19s where a guy took a 9-inch disc on a 7-inch grinder, ground the head down because of how bad it was, put it in the gasket back on the engine and ran it for another 1,000 hours. And then the engine was destroyed. But they had to have it running. What did they do when it was destroyed? Lord only knows, because a thousand hours in the crusher service that it was on, or even generator service, that's not a lot. Not when you're running 12, 10, 12 hours a day. That's not a lot. But they had to have it move. And they made other plans so that they could operate with the unit down. So you look at me and, that's not the right way. What situation are you in? We never had, in 10 years, I talked to the guy directly and I was involved working with him as the machine shop and even prior some. In 10 years, he never had a failure from any recommendation that I did. And he had me do it because he was too busy. He used to do it himself. Not the entire valve job, but just resurface the head and put it back on. When I'm the neighbor, just up the road, 10, 12 miles, he'd come up, drop the head off. I could go through it, crack check it, and then he could put it right back on without chasing to Utica 
another 40 mile trip, 80 mile round trip for each part. It saved a lot of time. And he says, if it's within spec, then we need to leave it alone. We did. If I'd had money, I would have bought a resurfacer. Trust me on that one. Why? No, well, because if the thing is warp seven thousandths and twisted four, and you can take it out, you're at that sharp edge. But he says, nope, I put in new head bolts. It'll be fine. So, and the other one is, uh, go to Jamesy Online, Jameson Machine Incorporated. They'll, um, those guys and others, I forgot who the new one is I have on here, RCP or RCPI or something like that. Same thing, they always cut their heads. And they cut it before they do the valve job. And when they do, they often have to be more, when they put in new valves, new seats, and they shaved it five thousandths, well, now they got to bury into the seats deeper and now your injectors down in a hole at least another five thousands and if it's been done before which is the age of most of these that means that's in the whole ten thousands and now you have to get that extra ten thousands thick shim under that injector to bring it up ten thousands is critical they even start better that's why i look at these and they say oh we machined this set oh no no to put their warp, they're t mm -hmm. they are, but they'll handle themselves when they're a long one piece head. When you bolt it down, it will take care of itself in that specification range. Look, the manufacturer didn't come up with these numbers for a guess, they're maximums for a reason for rebuilding. You say, Well, that's so they can fail and make well, there's always that factor, but this is the one that's a serviceable limit, meaning. The engine can run a good long life. Maybe before it ran 6,000 hours. Well, if you follow the service limits, it might go 5,000. You lost 1,000. You saved a pile of money. And the engine runs better in the interim. But if it lasted six and you got four on the next overhaul with a few steps that you shaved off, but it runs better and cleaner, you get my drift? They're saying serviceable limit, meaning this is as far as it can go to be a good, long-life, serviceable engine. Last one I'm going to throw with you because this puts it in perspective. Crankshafts, correct? I've heard this for decades. You never grind a crank more than 10 thousandths on a diesel. You're better off getting a new crank, even if you do grind it 10. That's a quote I have heard literally thousands of times, not hundreds thousands of times it is the biggest lie in the machining industry ever in history it's huge do you think cummins offers 30 under bearings check the oem if they're available it's safe you ground through the hard surface and your point is what they're telling you it's a serviceable engine Meaning you tear it apart, you grind a crank, it costs you a quarter to a third of a new crankshaft if it's completely redone, end to end, straightened, and etc., etc. You saved a horrendous pile of money on a crankshaft that in some cases is $10,000. You had it machined, cleaned up, and straightened for $1,500, two grand, maybe three. And you have a serviceable unit. I had 8,000 hours before. I'm not going to get it now. No. Five, six. Please. Change your oil more often. Put a better grade of filter and oil in there. You'll get near your 8,000 again. Unless you do something stupid. Or ignore something that goes bad. And it's hard. You got an engine that's running all day long and injector goes bad. You probably aren't going to notice it right off. Especially with the newer engines and DPFs in them. Injector goes bad, you can't see it. I'm regenning a lot. Pull that little plug out or disconnect the DPF and watch the straight exhaust and see what's going on. Maybe you'll get an idea. Yes, you can run it with the exhaust off the DPF. It'll be fine. Trust me. We've had to do it. Just look at the exhaust that's coming out of there. They actually have smoke meters to put in there. They're about as accurate as a dog turd, but they work. So what I'm trying to say here is 
that when a crankshaft is offered in 30 under, 40 under, Chevy offered 60 under bearings for their 350. Well, that's never going to... Why not? That's a car on the road. 60 under is fine. Are you going to race with that? No! Well, wait a minute. Or do they? They grind a crankshaft special, rebalance them, and redesign them so the end is the size of a Honda four-cylinder bearing so they can turn 9 and 10,000 RPMs and lose some of the reciprocating centrifugal force that causes failures. So they can get maybe 2,000 miles, 3,000 miles total on the engine. They might run three races plus whatever. So they might put 5,000 miles on the engine total. Change bearings here and there. They're, they're looking for life, but a short life. That's the idea here, people. You're on the street. Who cares? I got heavy duty. Well, then you don't go 60. You might go 30 or 40. 20. Something else I've noticed the racing guys do. And uh, Steve Morris, Drag and Drive. And we've done it for decades. Your bearing clearance is off. And you have standard 1, 2, 3. 10, 1, 2, 3 in some engines. You don't find them in 20 or 30 very often. But occasionally you'll find that. You put it together. It's a standard crank. Dang, it says no more than four thousandths oil clearance. That's the service limit on standard bearing. Well, yeah, standard one. Now it's three thousandths. You're serviceable. That is correct. Put in standard shell, smaller shell, one thousandths. Now you're three thousandths. You're serviceable. Well, I could put two in there and make it work. Well, you can. You're starting to get into a sketchy area where this is narrow, but still. It's serviceable. Why not do it on both sides? That's up to you. You can put a one here and a one there. But if you put a half a one here, you've gained a half thousandths. So you're three to three and a half thousandths. Get my drift? Replace both shells. Now you're down to three. Well, yeah, but well, now you got to be careful of pull your bearings out and you have to check your bearing saddles all the way through. That's why they usually only do one end. Why? They're trying to balance out how it sits on the bearings. But if you change a half thousandths, it'll wear and take care of itself. For full serviceable life. Been there, done it. Old engines, cranks off. Polish the crank, go to put it in. Oh man, six th seven thousandths clearance. Okay. Well, sometimes you can find undersized bearings and say, just grind a crank. You're at that five or six thousandths. Well, now you put in your undersized bearings. If they're within a thousandths of each other all the way across that old engine, they never care. But check your line bore on the way through. Maybe you put that, it's off a little bit. You put that thousandths over bearing or thousandths under bearing. And you might find out that when you put your nice little round shaft through there and run your feeler gauges, you may find that that's perfect. Usually you can feel it. <laughs> when you're working with antiques and street cars that you want to run, I mean, don't be crazy. Steve Moore's talking to him. Yeah, bearing clearance is excessive. Okay. You know the holes are straight through the engine, but this journal is too small. Now they're just starting to play with put in a 1,000 under bearing in a 3,000, 4,000 horsepower engine. Please. Aluminum block. There's so much. I've watched it in one engine one time where the rear main bearing got knocked out of a 265 uh, Waukesha. The black twisted. You know what they did? They put in a patch. That's right. They put in a cast iron patch with brass screws. And then built it like the rest of the black and line, line boarded. it. Engine ran great. What do you want me to do? Seriously, what do you want to do? They fixed it. We had to put it together with shims because the black didn't untwist itself mysteriously. It was a serviceable tractor engine and a 50 horsepower, 60 horsepower engine. Don't overthink things, folks. Anyway... That's something I come up with between the two with Peck's pipe to here to give you an idea that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you just have to be careful with. Use your head.
And think about it. And then take responsibility for what you're building. It's one of the things I learned from Powell Machine. He's getting cams in it. We don't do this. We don't do that. In the last, I think I've only been listening to him for a month, month and a half. In the last month and a half, let's say, he said three, <coughs> excuse me, three cams and two sets of lifters that the customers wanted him to pay for. They failed. And he went and checked them and he says, these aren't even ours. So people are getting more and more unscrupulous these days, looking for a free dollar. I mentioned something on another page here about integrity of certain farmers in Schoharie County, New York. Trust me, there are a lot of farmers there that were unscrupulous and didn't want to pay you and you had to chase them down to get the money. And there's one of them in Montgomery County that screwed me good for a couple thousand dollars. Wasn't anything I could do because he said, take him to court and he doesn't have it. What do you mean? And I talked to a parts dealer there and he says, I took him to court. Couldn't get anything because he ain't got it. And because he's a farmer, they won't force it out of him. Yeah. Like it paid for parts, not labor. So anyway, unless I trust somebody, that doesn't happen. And the worst of it is, I used to enjoy working on 7,000 Alice Charmers transmissions, the 7,000 series, 200s, 185s, 170, 175, all of that, all the way down through D14s, d twelve. Loved putting TAs in the internationals. I enjoyed that work. But if people are going to try and screw... When you are half the money of a dealer and they're still trying to screw you and turn you in to their loan department, you know you're working with people that really don't give a rip. They'll take what they can get and run and go to somebody else. So one of them, I told him, I said, you took too long the last time. So what do you mean? I need you here now. Not happening. You haven't paid me the last three times I've been there. I gave you 50 bucks. I said, yeah, out of what? 400? 500? I said, the answer is no. No money, no deal. Well, nobody else is coming either. I got a feeling it's the same problem, isn't it? You pay up and pay ahead. I'll be there. It took a while. I got my money. Another one I told him, well, you know, I've never done it before. It's what do you mean? Ernie, we're going to court. What are you talking about? We're going to court. You've got the slip and I've got the slip. You haven't paid. The date's on it, too. It's unpaid. I'll have to see you in small claims court. Shazam! Money showed up. That was after he swore up and down he had the cash. And then swore up and down I get it in the next milk check. Three or four milk checks later and a threat that was not a threat anymore. Yeah. Just some thoughts for you people to take on today. Started from Pex and somebody talking too fast and it got here. I know. I frankly don't care. This is my channel. I can do that. But I've also talked to you about some other scrupulous people that are out there that know what they're talking about. And they're still getting shafted. Now, if you want to learn how to tear apart international tractors and work on them, I suggest you go to Just a Few Acres Farm and vi visit Pete and Hillary. No, Hillary doesn't tear tractors apart, but she works with, with him on the farm. And he has a bunch of take-apart videos, Farm LCs, MDs. I don't know if he did a little work on his H or not. And he's got an old one. I can't remember what it was, whether it was a W Series or something else. Real old bugger. Beautiful old thing. 70 years old or something. A short one that used to be a steel wheeler. Um, his latest one, well, he has 756, 656, 504. 856 is the one he's working on now. So you want to learn something about an international? Because up to the 86 series, the rear ends didn't change much. I will say this. I think it was the 06 series that came through with their park lock. You'll see his 856 he tore apart has a huge spring on the park lock. Some of the early ones did not have that. And if you didn't adjust that little drop lever properly, you didn't have a park. And there was more than one guy parked their tractor on a hill, depending on that wonderful park mechanism that was in that, excuse me, tractor, where they could park it on a hill instead of your little Fords holding a brake and ended up with it down in the dooryard or through a building. Because it sat there for a while and the ground just kind of caved a little bit. And whew, down the hill, that park is not to be depended on on hills or anywhere else. 
You park your tractor with the wheels turned if you have to park on a grade and no load behind it, just like you would as if you were locking the brakes or leaving it in gear. Never depend on compression, never depend on the brakes, never depend on the park to hold the load. That's just to keep the tractor in place from minor grades and things get pushing it around. Capiche? All right. Especially with the older David Browns. Why? Because you pull the T-lever to shut it off. Some of them didn't have a lock. So when you released it, there was more than one David Brown that started down the hill and they started very well. And down they'd go under power. True story. If you're in first gear, it's hard to roll it over. So you put it in low, right? And now the tractor moves slower with a lot more power and force. So don't. Okay? Check the wheels if you need. Parking brake. Park. Be safe.